if in case okay good nothing happened all right good morning and everyone uh, good morning everyone welcome back to bc308 and this is our second lecture on revelation daniel uh, we are looking at daniel chapter 8 and trying to understand it and of course uh, taking a few questions now i can see that there are some more questions so we will do that and then i'll quickly summarize daniel 8 one more time um okay kishan you have a question okay i'm not sure if uh, kishan has a question um there's a question here in the chat abhishek asks according to matthew 25 parable of 10 virgins 50% went to be with the Lord, 50% left behind. My question is, if the unprepared believer left behind during reign of Antichrist, how they will survive and what they can do to save themselves from Mark of the Beast and Antichrist? Okay. So, in Matthew 25, the parable of the virgins. Now, remember, a parable is only a story to illustrate spiritual truth, right? It's not to be interpreted literally, right? So Jesus said there are ten virgins, five came prepared, five didn't come. So five ran out of oil, and they couldn't light their lamps, and so they had to go buy oil. And in the meantime, the bridegroom came, and those who had oil had could light their lamps and join the wedding party. That was the story. Now, it is wrong to interpret the numbers. Like, it's wrong to say 50% of believers will go to heaven. That's not what Jesus said. Right? Remember, um, uh, we, we, we studied interpretation of scripture, hermeneutics. We studied how to interpret parables. Parables are never meant to be interpreted like this and then you know we will get all kinds of interpretations parables and these stories are given to us to communicate a spiritual truth what is the spiritual truth jesus wants to communicate to us through this parable example we've got to be ready right we've got to have what it takes to be ready for the coming of the lord that's the message it's not about the oil it's not about the lanterns it's not about how many virgins it's not about that. He could have said there were, you know, there were ten virgins and uh, one came without oil and nine came with oil. You know, so that doesn't mean you know, it's not about the numbers. The point is, there are some who are ready, some who are not ready. So it's wrong for us to say fifty percent of believers will be taken to heaven. That's a wrong interpretation or a wrong handling of the parable, because you never do that with the parables, literally, right? You take the message. What is the message? We have to be ready because Jesus is coming when we don't know. We, we don't know when he's coming. So we have to be ready spiritually, be alert spiritually. You know, some people take the oil to represent the Holy Spirit. Some people will take the lantern to represent the church and all kinds of things, which are not were not intended by Jesus in giving us the parable. That's not the intent. Right? Because then we can make up anything, you know. Like, for example, Jesus gave the story of the Good Samaritan, right? He said there was this uh, Samaritan, uh, this Jew was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and the thieves came, beat him up, and then there was a priest who came by, he just walked by. There was a Levite who came by, he just walked by, and a Samaritan came, and the Samaritan poured the oil and the wine and uh, and took care of him and took him in, you know. So Jesus gave that story, and then people interpret all kinds of things. You know, oh, um, uh, he took him to the, you know, he took him to the inn. The inn represents the church, and um, uh, you know, uh, the oil and the wine represent um, uh, whatever. You can make up anything, you know, and they make up all these things. But was that what Jesus was that what Jesus was saying? No, Jesus was answering a question: Who is my brother? The point he was trying to get across is anybody who is in need, whom we help, that's the the person, that's our brother whom we're supposed to help. And we cross 
ethnic lines, we cross racial lines, we cross social lines. The point that a Samaritan was helping a Jew, that's the point. You cross, go across boundaries to help somebody in need. That's your brother. That's what he was answering, right? But you know, you hear all kinds of sermons, you know, the Jew on the donkey and all kinds of things. You know, the rab the robbers represent Satan and and all those things. But that's not what Jesus was saying. He was answering the question, who is my brother? The message of the story is very simple. Anyone who is in need, you help. That's your brother. That's the person you're supposed to help. Okay. So the point again I want to get across is we shouldn't misinterpret scripture. Don't read into scripture more than what was intended. Don't allegorize parables. You know, we learned in hermeneutics not to allegorize. That means don't assign a meaning that was not intended by the speaker. So uh, that's uh, that's why you know when I when I when I look at that question, it's it's it's. 50%, 50%, no, that's not what we should be doing with scripture. What is the message? The message is we need to be ready for the coming of the Lord and spiritually ready, alert, take what we need to be. Alert. But to answer the second part of the question, will there be believers during the tribulation? Of course. Will there be some believers, you know, uh, you know who gets left behind that's, you know, uh, that's for the Lord to decide. But we know that any, everyone who is a believer who is in Christ is going to go up into heaven because we are saved by grace. And from our side, we have to live in readiness and live faithful to the Lord. What will happen to the believers who are in the tribulation? Well, it's going to be very difficult for them. Um, we can see that throughout the book of Revelation, there are, I think, at least three times when we get a vision into heaven and we see the martyred souls coming up before the throne of God. That means people who have died during the tribulation, they're coming up into heaven before the throne of God. So there will be believers who die uh, during the tribulation. Uh, we also see in one of the chapters, and I think it's Revelation 14, where there's an angel announcing, telling believers, to telling people, do not receive the mark of the beast. So there are five angels uh, who God uh, is sending during the tribulation to make announcements. And one of the angels is specifically saying, do not receive the mark of the beast. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. You know, uh, So uh, God, uh, God is giving encouragement to believers to not receive the mark of the beast. Uh, uh, but the result of re refusing that is is death. Many will die. So uh, to answer your question, it'll be very difficult during the tribulation period for those who believe, uh, and uh, those who there will be many who are martyred for their faith in Christ. Uh, but there is the announcement: you are blessed for being martyred for your faith. Okay. So uh, I, I didn't mean to be rude to you, Abhishek. I just wanted to, you know, kind of remind us that we have to interpret scripture correctly. Uh, uh, and um, uh, let's start, you know, okay. All right, Kishan, you have a question or maybe not? I don't know. All right. Um, okay, so let's just quickly recap Daniel 8, all right? And then we'll go to Daniel 9. So Daniel chapter 8. Daniel sees this vision, the ram and the goat. In the chapter itself, a lot of the meaning is given. The ram uh, represents the kingdom of Medes and per Persia. The ram has two horns, one small horn, one big horn. Small horn represents Medes, big horn represents Persia. It, uh, it's already it's given specifically in Revelation 8, 20, 21. And then the goat that comes up from the west and moves eastward, he says, hey, that's the kingdom of Greece. The goat has one big long horn that's pointing to Alexander the Great. He moved very fast, very strong. Uh, he expanded his territory, but then he was cut off. He died young. Then uh, that kingdom was divided into four parts. The four generals, uh, the four generals of Alexander the Great, managed or ruled these four kingdoms, four parts of his kingdom. Then he says, in the latter times, 
in the last days a little horn will come from one of those four horns so we said broadly speaking those four regions uh, are all around one is one region is around greece one is around turkey one is around syria and that part and one is around northern africa the um, egypt um, that part so from any of the, the, those regions will come this little horn which is the antichrist but when will he come he tells us in two uh, places you know, it's in the latter times, in the time of the end. So this little horn will come. He will speak great things. He will uh, gain influence on the earth. He will be demonically empowered. So he has influence in the spiritual realm. He speaks against the prince of the host or the prince of princes, meaning he's blaspheming God. And what does he do? He uh, he stops the daily sacrifices. He um, casts truth to the ground that he violates all forms of justice. And he he uh, tears down, or he uh, the place of a sanctuary was cast down. He desecrates uh, the, the the temple, right? And so that's descriptive of this uh, this uh, this little horn. And then he gives us, you know, that the sacrifices uh, has a duration of about two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings. So we said, okay, evening and morning, meaning if you two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, so that. You know, if you divide it by two, uh, it represents, um, it is 1,150 days, about three and a half years. So that's the rough period of time when these daily sacrifices will be happening and then will be stopped. Uh, uh, and the sanctuary will be, then after that, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Um, yeah, so that's the 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 key things, key things that we see here in Daniel chapter 8. All right. So I'm going to move into Daniel chapter 9. Uh, is everyone okay? You ready to go into 9, chapter 9? Any questions on 8? Okay. So let's go into Daniel chapter 9. Now, so what happens in Daniel chapter 9? In Daniel chapter 9, uh, Daniel is very troubled by you know the visions that he had, and uh, he is uh, uh, he's now Daniel chapter nine, beginning of chapter nine. Uh, he is in the reign of Darius, the lineage of the Medes. So now he is, you know, he's come out of that the Babylonian Empire. What he's talking about is what's happening now under the Medes, and uh, he is. You know, it's that time period. So he's under under Darius. So remember, Daniel lived through three empires: the Babylonians, the Medes, and then the Persians. So he's now, you know, Darius is the ruler, and um, Daniel he remembers the words of Jeremiah the prophet. So this, I'm looking at Daniel chapter nine, verse two. Uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter. We'll read from verse twenty onwards. But I'm just kind of giving us the background, and then we will get into reading. Uh, verse 20 onwards. So in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, Daniel remembers the prophecy of Jeremiah. So this is, you know, the Medes have come in now. They've overthrown Belshazzar. He's killed. Darius is in charge. Of course, Daniel is still serving in the court. And that time he remembers, hey, Jeremiah prophesied that we will be in captivity for 70 years. So, 70 years is coming to an end. I mean, it's coming close, sorry, it's coming close to that end of 70 years. And what does Daniel do? He starts praying. You know, and so Daniel's, Daniel 9, verse 3, he says, I set my face toward the Lord to make requests by prayer and supplication. So he begins to pray. And so we read Daniel's prayer, Daniel chapter 9, and he's basically crying out. He's saying, God, you spoke through Jeremiah. You said that after 70 years is over, uh, we will be able to go back to our land. Uh, so God forgive the sins of the people. I, you know, he's confessing, he's praying on behalf of the people. So you can see Daniel being an intercessor. You know, beautiful, beautiful picture of him interceding uh, for the people. And while he is praying and interceding, 
and he is uh, looking to God based on the prophecy of Jeremiah the prophet he has a visitation from Gabriel okay so we're going to read that part so Daniel chapter 9 let's read from verse 20 to verse 27 somebody could uh, maybe we can just let, do what we did before three verses each Daniel chapter 9 20 to 27 please Can I read yeah, we can we can take turns. So go ahead, please, Sri Kumar, you can start. 22, 21. St yeah, starting with verse 20. You can read three verses. Sure, Pastor. And while and while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yeah. Whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had been in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Um, God, At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word, to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moats, but in the troubled time. Okay. Someone can finish. Now, therefore, and under, uh, now therefore, no, therefore, and understand that from going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and, and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with, with the flood. Until the end of the war, desolation are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice an offering, and on the wing of uh, abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the uh, consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel, and he says, Daniel, uh, you know, you are greatly beloved of God. I'm looking at verse uh, 23, uh, verse 22, it says, I've come to give you skill to understand things so you know Daniel has seen all these visions but now Gabriel is come to give him some further information further understanding of things to come end times so he begins like this verse 24 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city so he says Daniel God has planned 70 weeks. And this 70 weeks is very specifically concerning your people, that is the Jews or Israel, and your holy city, that's Jerusalem. That means this 70 weeks, the focus of the 70 weeks is your people 
and Jerusalem. Now, 70 weeks. How do we understand this? And uh, I, I'm going to preemptively state certain things. Um, so, each week represents a period of seven years. Now, in some of your Bibles, verse 24, it'll say 70 weeks, and next to the word weeks, you have a number, and it says 70 sevens. 70 sevens. So 70 times seven is 490. Now, each, each week, represents seven years, or it represents 490 years. Now, um, how can you say, you know, a week represents seven years? We have a cross-reference. So you could cross-reference, example, in Genesis 29, if, if you want to turn there. In Genesis 20, and, and these are in your PDF notes, so in, in, you don't have to write it down. It's in the notes that I've already given you. Uh, I'm just explaining. In Genesis 29, the way the Jews used the term week, a week would represent a period of seven years. How do we know it? One, one cross reference. Genesis 29, verse 27, when you know Jacob goes and works for his uncle Laban, and he says he wants to marry Rachel, he says in verse 27, fulfill her week. And we'll give you this one also for the service you will serve with me still another seven years. So what was a week? A week was seven years. So they understood, they meaning the Jewish people. Daniel, he understood what a week represents, seven years. So when Gabriel said seven weeks in 70 times seven years 490 years so um, Gabriel is saying hey I, I, God I want to talk to you about these 490 years that are very specifically about your people I'm back in Daniel chapter 9 okay so Daniel 9 24 I'm very specifically talking to you about your people and your holy city and I want to talk to you about this 490 year period What's going to happen? He says, God has set aside 490 years to, to accomplish certain things. What? To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. So that's one part. That means during this 490 years, God is going to finish certain things. One, he's going to deal with sin. Transgression, sins, iniquity. Very interesting. Three different words, right? Transgressions, sin, iniquity. So that's the first part. God is going to deal with this. Then he continues. So he's going to deal with transgression, sin, iniquity. And then what? He's going to bring in. So he's going to deal with something. Then he's going to usher in something. What? What's he going to usher in? He's going to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy. That means to complete, to wrap up all the visions and prophecies he ever gave to finish all of them and to anoint the most holy in, in some Bibles, there'll be a no margin number there. It says to anoint the most holy place. So either way is fine. So these 490 years, God is going to do two big things. One, he's going to deal with sin. Second, he's going to bring in righteousness. He's going to fulfill all prophetic words. And he's going to anoint, he's going to consecrate the most holy now you can interpret it as the most holy one or the most holy place. Both is fine. We'll explain that. But in this 490 years, these are the two big things God is going to do. And this is how it's going to be broken up. So this program is going to happen. 
in two scenes or two two parts how is it going to happen verse 25 understand Daniel from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem that means King Cyrus came into the picture okay it had not yet happened it was going to happen right remember this this vision is given is being given during the time of King Darius the Mede later on Cyrus the Persian is going to come and he is the one who's going to give the command to go back and rebuild Jerusalem okay so it's still pointing in the future so it says in verse 25 know this that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince so he's talking about the first duration of time which is going to which has to do with dealing with transgression iniquity and sin right so until the time is from the time the command is given to go and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks what is seven plus 62 69 that means there'll be a total of 69 weeks from the time there is a command to go and rebuild Jerusalem till the Messiah comes 69 weeks is 483 years and that was fulfilled from the time King Cyrus told the Jews go and rebuild Jerusalem till Jesus came 483 years the 69 weeks or 62 plus 7 or, or 7 plus 62 which is 69 the 69 weeks was fulfilled okay then he says the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous troublesome times so, so uh, the time comes the, the decree will be issued to go back and rebuild Jerusalem Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt um, the city the street and the city it's going to be rebuilt in difficult times yes and from that time till the Messiah comes will be 7 plus 62 which is 69 weeks verse 26 and after the 62 weeks that means 7 plus 62 Right? That means totally 69 weeks. He is just is giving it 7 plus 62. So after the 62, meaning totally 69 weeks, what will happen? Verse 26, Messiah will be cut off. Messiah will die. Messiah will be killed. But not for himself. So Jesus died. But of course, he didn't die for himself. He died for the rest of the world. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So Messiah will be cut off. What will happen? The people who will be there at that time, the Romans basically, of the prince who is to come, the Romans they will destroy the city and the sanctuary so Jer jerusalem the temple was destroyed so jesus died AD 30 AD 70 the temple and jerusalem was destroyed by the romans titus the roman general destroyed the end of it shall be with a flood till the end of the war desolations are determined so Till the end, war and desolations are going to continue in the city. Okay, so now, what has he said? He has taken care of 69 weeks. The 69 weeks has to do with the time from the order being issued to go and rebuild Jerusalem till the Messiah comes 69 weeks the Messiah comes for one purpose 
to deal with transgression, iniquity, and sin. That's the first part. He's going to be killed, but not for himself. The, the people who are in those days, with the help of their prince, they are going to destroy the city and the temple. And till the end, there will be war and desolation going on. Okay. Verse 27. So how many weeks are left? Or There's another one week left. 69 weeks are over, one week left. That means another period of seven years are left. The first period, period of 69 weeks was meant to deal, was the build up towards dealing with sin, iniquity, and righteousness. The last seven years, the last week, is the build up leading to righteousness being ushered in, all prophecy being fulfilled, and the most holy being anointed. Last seven. Righteousness being assured, the millennium, all prophecy fulfilled, all the things spoken of till the end times will be fulfilled, last seven years. And the Holy One anointed Jesus to be anointed as King, and He's going to rule and reign a thousand years. So the seven years is this last bit that's left. So, verse 27, what will happen during those seven years? Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So we finish 69 weeks, one week is left. What's going to happen in that one week? He, right? Now, we said, like, who is this he that he's talking about? Well, we know a little later on in that same verse, he refers to him as the abomination, the one who makes desolate. And then Jesus referred to him as the abomination of desolation. Paul also referred to him in 2 Thessalonians 2 as the, the, the man of perdition, the man of sin. Okay, so he says here, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So 69 weeks are over, one week is left. What's going to happen in that one week? This Antichrist is going to set up a covenant. He's going to set up a peace treaty, or you can say a peace accord, or he's going to come in on the scene like this. He's going to set up a peace treaty for one week, for seven years. But, verse 27, but in the middle of the week, that is three and a half years, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Hey, we read about that earlier. We read about it in chapter 8, that this little horn will come and he will stop sacrifice and offering. So that same thing is being continued here. This little horn who's speaking pompous things is the one who's going to stop sacrifice and offering. He, he's talking about that man. He is going to bring an end to sacrifice and offering when? During the middle of that seven-year period. And on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. That this man is going to move so fast. Wings of abomination. Abomination is doing everything that's bad before God. Terrible. So he's going to move so quickly to do evil. That wings of abomination. And he's going to make desolate. He's going to totally destroy, desecrate, you know, make, you know, make utterly. You know, utter destruction. He's going to make, he's the one who's going to make utter destruction. Even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. That means, till all the judgments that have been, just, you know, God has determined is poured out. So, he said, I'm going to tell you about 70 weeks, 490 years. I want to talk to you. This 490 years has to do with specifically with Israel and Jerusalem. And there are two big things that are going to happen in this, this period I'm talking about. First, sin, iniquity, and transgression. God is going to deal with it. 
which happened to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he's going to usher in righteousness, he's going to fulfill all prophecy, and he's going to anoint the most holy, that all that will happen just before the millennium. It's going to happen in these 490 years. But these 490 years are divided into two parts, 483 plus 7. And in between this 483 plus 7 is a gap of about 2,000 some years. So it's not, it's not a continuous 490 years. It's 483 plus another 7. In between, there's a time gap. One is something that will happen in the near future. One will happen in the distant future. 2,000 years gap. In the four first 69 weeks, 483 years, that's going to happen from the time Cyrus issues the decree for the people to go back to Jerusalem till Jesus comes and dies on the cross. Jerusalem will be destroyed. And from the time Jerusalem is destroyed till the end, there'll be lots of war and desolation going on as far as Israel and Jerusalem is concerned. And then comes the seven-year period, which actually is a period when this little horn, this man that we spoke about, who's, who, who, you know, he's going to come and set up a peace treaty. He's going to set up a treaty, a covenant, a promise for seven years. That's how he's going to come into power. But in the middle of the seven years, he's going to move on the wings of desert, abomination. He's going to move so fast and do evil things. He's going to stop the sacrifices, and he's going to uh, do everything that's abominable before God until God fully pours out all of his wrath, and that comes to the end of the seven years. At the end of the seven years, what will happen? Righteousness will be introduced, the millennium. At the end of the seven years, what will happen? Prophecy will be fulfilled. End of the seven years, what will happen? The Most Holy will be anointed. Did you understand Daniel 9, 24 to 27? Yes, Pastor, Pastor. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Somebody has a question. Kennedy, Kennedy, go ahead, please. Yeah, just please explain to me. What about the intertestament here? Was it part of this uh, prophecy that Daniel saw? Uh, sorry, Kennedy. Uh, um, what about the intertestament period? The period, the, 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 the period between the old and the new testament. Was it also part of this, this 400 years? Yeah, so the intertestament period. Uh, would so would come so we're talking about the 400 years between Malachi approximately 400 years between Malachi to the coming of Christ which we refer to as the intertest intertestamental period that comes as part of the 483 years, right? The 483 years is from the time of rebuilding Jerusalem until the time of the coming of Christ, which includes this period. Because remember, Haggai, Zechariah, they were there during this rebuilding of the temple during troublous times, the streets of the re rebuilding the temple and the city during troublous times. And they prophesied. And then comes Malachi, who wraps up, he was the last Old Testament prophet shortly after that. And then we go into this silent period of 400 years, which we refer to the inter as the intertestament 
period, but that is part of the 483 years or the first 69 weeks. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Okay, I see a question, Christopher. I may have missed this. How do you relate the 490 years to the current time, 2023, and the number of years that has elapsed? Um, so there is no, uh, let, let's say this, there is no, uh, there's no chapter in verse that connects that. All we know is that the 490 years that De Gabriel spoke about is not 490 continuous years, but it's broken up into 69 plus 7, uh, 70 weeks, or you know, 483 plus 7. It's broken up in these two parts because that's how it's Gabriel gave it to Daniel. What is implicit? but not stated is that this separation is a big time because the last seven years, as if you go back to Daniel 7 is, it's for the latter time, it's for the end of times. That's what we can take. And we will also see it in Daniel 12. But there is no relation between the 490 and the 2000 years, you know, there is no relation. So, anything we do, you know, some people use Jewish years and this and that, and all, that's all speculation. It's not chapter and verse. Some people want to do those kinds of things, but there is no explicit reference, chapter and verse, that connects 2023 to the time gap between the 69 years and the 70th year. Okay, so one thing I need to mention is that last seven years is ref is referred to as Daniel's seventieth year. So when people talk about Daniel's seventieth, uh, sorry, Daniel's seventieth week, they're referring to this last week or last seven year period, okay, which we refer to as the Great Tribulation and so on. Kennedy, your question, please. Thank you. I'm still back for my original question. If Daniel, when did the process of Daniel take effect? That's the first question. If you Sorry, what? When did the prophecy of Daniel take effect? Because if you add the intertestament period, which takes about 400 years, with the period that Daniel lived, it doesn't add up to that 490. Sorry, Kennedy, I can I couldn't hear you clearly. Uh, could you please repeat again? What I'm saying is that when did the prophecy of Daniel take effect? When did it start? That's one. Secondly, if you have to add the intertestament period with the time that Daniel lived, it's more than that. That 490 years, so it doesn't add up. Okay, when did Daniel's prophecy take effect? First question. Uh, he says it starts from the time of the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Right? So that's when the 69 weeks begin, right? Um, the the time to go and rebuild Jerusalem, King Cyrus, right? And the intertestamental period is part of the 483 years. It's not an addition to, but it's part of the 483 years. Uh, let me see if I put it in the notes, the PDF that I've shared with you. Um, let's see. I've given you those things. Yeah. Okay. All right. So 
yeah, okay, I didn't mention the the year. Uh, I just explained in the notes. Um, for eighty-three years from the decree of Cyrus. Okay. So, um, yeah, okay. I haven't given you the actual year in the notes, but the second part of your question is the intertestamental period is not added to the 483 years it's part of the 483 years because the 483 years spans the time from king cyrus to the coming of messiah okay uh, that's what I was trying to say. I'm, I'm not sure, Kennedy, um, what exactly the, your question was. Um, you were saying you're trying you're trying to add it to the intertestamental period, but it's not addition to, but it's a part of. Okay, uh, let me just look at Tasha's last one and. Um, Okay, I got Kennedy's okay. Kennedy said, okay, Tasha. Uh, still processing, though I would like to know the scripture reference of where to find the 69,497. Yeah. So uh, the 69, it's all in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Uh, um, it's all here. And uh, the cross reference for one week representing seven years is Genesis 29, 27, 28. Right, so that I've kind of explained it in the PDF in the notes. So if you look at it, uh, whatever I've shared, it's in the PDF in the notes. So that would be helpful. Okay, um, we are also in our break time. Say if you, if your question is quick, I could try to answer it. Otherwise, we can pick it up next week. Um, uh, no, no worries, Pastor. No worries. Okay. All right. So we'll pick up. Uh, we will definitely, you know, we'll come back to. We'll just kind of do a quick revision. Uh, of Daniel 9 next week. So um, please uh, examine this. And then if you have any questions, doubts, we can definitely uh, spend time on it uh, before we go forward into the other chapters. Okay. So we will definitely review Daniel 9 again uh, next class and take up more questions. Um, let's close in prayer, please. Somebody could close because we're already into our break time. Uh, Father. Thank you so much. Uh, go ahead. I'm not sure who was praying. Go ahead. Asha, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, Asha, go ahead. God, thank you so much for today, Lord. Thank you, God, that we got to learn from you, Lord, from book of Daniel. Lord, that you always have our visions and dreams for us, God. Thank you, Lord, for that we had to uh, learn about the book of Daniel and how our things work for God. Lord, we trust you and the way we learn God, we you not know, just uh, listen and go away from the uh, class, but instead, Lord, we uh, hide them in our hearts and share to those who've never heard about it, God. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Ashish. We pray over all the students. Bless them, Lord, and, and thank you, Lord, for everything. In name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. We will um, dismiss. I'll see you in the next class. God bless. Bye now.